Right, so my name is uh, Dr. Boone. I'm kind of a joint replacement, spe or joint replacement specialist in uh, Bellevue, Washington here in the Seattle area. Uh, I'm going to give a little bit of a kind of a quick webinar, like a five or 10 minute discussion on uh, um, uh, some questions that a lot of people would have when they're considering having their hip or their knee replaced and uh, kind of some, some, you know, what to know, maybe some questions to answer, what to look for in a surgeon, uh, uh, some things like that. Maybe kind of, I'll also kind of talk a little bit about what to expect before, after uh, surgery and things like that. So, so I grew up on the east side of the state, uh, uh, north of Spokane. I uh, did my training originally in Seattle, uh, left the area uh, for about five or six years, went to Michigan, uh, Northern California, and then kind of came back to the Bellevue area for the past eight years. Uh, my specialty is trauma, um, but as we get older, uh, you know, we kind of uh, transition into some other practices. And so I also trained in hip and knee replacements. And now um, I do I do a lot of hip and uh, joint reconstruction, hip and knee replacements as well, too. So. Um, kind of some questions I think that a lot of patients have when they come in and see me or kind of some things that that we like to go over are, you know, why do I need my hip and knee replaced? Why am I in this position? <clears throat> this one I get, you know, probably 10 or 15 times a day. Well, when should I do it? Um, once we finally decide that it's time to get done, the questions are, well, what are my expectations before surgery? Uh, what's it going to be like? you know, the day of immediately afterwards. Uh, and then long term, what can I expect with my joint? What are things that I can do, uh, um, you know, activity wise, and kind of what are my expectations and kind of a time frame uh, on, on kind of what to expect and when. <clears throat> I always get the when will it wear out question. Uh, so we'll kind of talk about that one uh, a little bit as well too. And then what can I do so it doesn't wear out? Um, and so we can kind of talk about some of those as, as well too. Um, so the question, and then also, you know, who should do my surgeon? Uh, vetting a surgeon can be kind of overwhelming. Uh, it's hard to find good information. Um, you know, I do feel like a lot of people uh, re research kind of a car, but more, more, more so than their surgeon. And so there's a couple of questions, I think, that are very helpful to ask your surgeon um, to, to, to make sure that, that it's kind of the right fit for you. So. <clears throat> so I get this one all the time. Well, why do I need it replaced? Well, very simply because it's worn out. Um, the cartilage, you know, people think of arthritis as something that you catch. You don't catch arthritis. You, arthritis is actually the loss of the smooth gliding surface uh, that we have in our joints. So our hips and our knees have this kind of white kind of special surface that kind of degenerates and wears out over time. And pretty much you're, you're eventually rubbing the two ends of the bone together, um, you know, causing a bone on bone kind of arthritis or a bone on bone scenario kind of rubbing two pieces of sandpaper together is the description I use. It's just painful and it grinds. And so that's when it's time to have that joint replaced. That's called osteoarthritis. There are other types of arthritis, but the, the, the general principle is that the joint wears out. And what causes this? Um, it's multifactorial. So patients um, um, can have a family history of arthritis. So there's a genetic component. Um, there's a, a traumatic component. If you've had a fracture or something in your past, that can do it. Uh, and then there's some other kind of uh, other diseases, things like rheumatoid arthritis, um, things like diabetes increase your chance of having arthritis uh, um, uh, and just, you know, kind of some, some other things. But general principle is that the joint wears out and, and you have a lot of pain and dysfunction from, the, from this. <clears throat> arthritis is um, extremely common. So by 2030, uh, close to 70 million adults will actually have arthritis. And that's you know, one in five uh, uh, will we'll need a joint replacement at some point. Uh, we do 500,000 joint replacements a year in the U.S. That number is low. It's likely going to double or triple in the next 10 to 15 years. It's a super common thing. Um, and so we're going to see we're going to see joint replacements kind of continue uh, uh, to increase. Uh, I describe it as it's kind of the wave that's just offshore and this wave is coming close and we're just a, it's kind of hitting shore now slowly and over the next, you know, 10 or 15 years, we're going to see a significant increase in people who need their joints replaced. <clears throat> so the question I get, when should I have it replaced? I think general questions I ask my patients are simply, how bad is it? Um, you know, how many days in the last two or three weeks have been tough for you? Is it one day in three weeks? 
is it every day? Uh, um, you know, more, more, more bad days than good days uh, is, is a question I typically pose to my patients. Uh, and then specifically, how, how severely does it affect your day-to-day -day activities or what we call your ADLs, your activities of daily living? Does it hurt to go to the store? Does it hurt when you go to Costco? Um, do you have pain at night? Um, you know, simple things like, does it hurt to come into my office? Uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, do you have a limp? Uh, are you grouchy? You know, pain puts people in a bad mood. It, 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 it uh, uh, um, you know, causes depression and, and weight gain and all that type of stuff. Uh, how do you sleep? Uh, a lot of patients with arthritis will have difficulty sleeping, which then just becomes this kind of vicious cycle of you don't have any sleep, so you don't, you don't function well through the next day, and it just kind of gets worse and worse. Um, one that I ask patients, are you canceling vacations? Uh, you know, do you have a vacation plan with the grandkids to Disneyland and you're not looking forward to it because it's going to hurt? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a pretty severe symptom. Um, you will get, if you come into my office, you will get a specific survey. Uh, we call them the hoose and the coos, which is the hip or the knee scores. And, and these are real simple questions, kind of like the questions I have above. Um, and they, they, they're scored on zero to 100. Zero is bad, 100 is good. And this can give you a number or an idea of really how bad your, your arthritis is or how bad your function is. Uh, um, and so this is a really good score that I give patients. If somebody comes and they have knee pain and they're a 90, uh, I, I don't think that's a good joint to replace. But if they're a 10, then it's one of those that we should probably replace because you're, you're, you're severely affected multiple surveys out there. They're all good. They're all bad. They all have their limitations. Um, the Oxford knee score, uh, things like that you'll see in your surgeon's office. And these are, these are becoming pretty standard. Um, insurance companies are requiring them and they really help the patient um, and the surgeon figure out how bad is this. And then the last thing we look at is the arthritis grade on your x-rays. Typically, we don't recommend joint replacements until there's really no tread left on the tires. So bone on bone arthritis, and this is a good x-ray that you can see here. So the knee is kind of three compartments. There's an inside, an outside, and a top or a kneecap joint. And if you look at this x-ray here on the, if you see the, the, the one right underneath the L, that's kind of for the left knee. You can see on the inside there, those two bones are touching each other. That is bone on bone arthritis. And if you look to the outside there, you actually can see some joint space left. So this patient has pretty typical bone on bone arthritis on the inside or the medial part of the knee. It's very common for us to see this. And so this is a joint that is likely extremely painful um, and one that would do well from, uh, from a surgery. So, uh, points of no return, patients will ask me, well, what if I don't do it now? What if I wait, can I wait? The answer is, yeah, you can always wait. This is an elective procedure, um, but there are things or are red flags for what I tell my patients that if you get past this, you will have a lower chance or you will have a higher risk of having a complication or not a good outcome. Um, loss of motion, especially in the knee, is something to really monitor. The best predictor of motion after surgery is motion before. So if you show up in my office and you have bad motion before, you shouldn't expect great motion after. We're gonna to have to work hard with physical therapy. I get the therapist in your, your house the next day. Um, they're really pushing you for motion. Uh, it is a double-edged sword. You don't wanna to go too crazy because the incision can open up and things like that. But once you start to lose a lot of motion, that is concerning and it is definitely something that should be done sooner rather than later. I tell my patients, it's not like we have to do it tomorrow, but it's definitely something that should be done with if you're losing a lot of motion within six to eight months or something. And then severe deformity. Um, you can see this x-ray here at the bottom. Um, the left knee has been replaced. It's nice and straight. And you don't have to go to uh, orthopedic residency to see how crooked that right knee is. That is a concern because when I straighten that out, I'm going to have to straighten out some of the nerves. And that has an increased chance of postoperative complications, nerve damage, infection. It's going to be harder to do the surgery. You can have fractures. So patients with severe deformity and loss of mobility and loss of motion, uh, it is, uh, that's, that can be concerning. This rarely happens in my office. I rarely get somebody that gets this bad um, um, when they show up, but it can happen occasionally. And we can still deal with it. I, we do these surgeries all the time, but it does put you at an increased risk. Uh, and it is a question I get asked a lot. So 
short term, um, you know, I tell everybody, uh, take other people's input with a grain of salt. Um, surgeons have different approaches, technology changes. Uh, you know, uh, patients will say, well, my cousin had this done five years ago and they said they were riding their bike. You know, they rode their bike home from the, the surgery. They were walking Mount Rainier two weeks later. The, the farther you get away from a traumatic event, the less traumatic it was. And so if somebody tells you they had their knee replaced 10 years ago and it was a walk in the park, it's not necessarily true. It, when you're going through this at the time, it's, it, it's, it's one of those things. Now, that being said, talking to somebody who's had a joint, there's nothing better than that. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good frame of reference. But just realize that everybody responds to things very differently and everybody definitely has a different experience on what, what they thought they went through. Um, you know, talk to a caregiver who actually went through it with somebody. They may have a totally different experience than the patient. Um, the goal is that one year you forgot you had your joint replaced. That's, that's what we're looking for. You're walking down the road and you forgot you had your joint replaced. What happens in between is different from patient to patient. But the goal is, is the marathon, you're doing great at one year. <clears throat> um, Preoperatively, you're going to get clearances. You're going to need to see your, your primary care doctor, your cardiologist, your nephrologist, your rheumatologist, whoever you see for medical problems, we're going to need to help them. We're going to need to get those notes together. So it's really important to have. You'll get some labs. You'll get an HNP, kind of the standard stuff before your surgery. Um, so you have your joint replaced, your hip or your knee. And I will say, for the most, most part, hips are much easier than knees. And, and, you know, if you talk to your therapist, they'll probably tell you the same thing. The hip patient is just, it's just not as painful as a knee replacement. And so you don't compare a hip to a knee. Definitely. That's, that's definitely not a good comparison to make, <clears throat> but the, we treat them both the same. Um, typically at two to three hours, we have patients up and walking. So you're out of bed walking. We have accelerated rehab protocols. Um, 70 percent of my patients go home the same day now uh, if you stay in the hospital it's typically because you have a major medical problem like you're on dialysis uh, or something like that now um, working with these in-home therapy uh, you, you know uh, companies and, and physical therapists that can come to your house now um, we found that getting patients home is better than keeping them in the hospital you're not exposed to infection um, it's just it's a good thing to do and we've come up with really good protocols for that I tell patients the first two days uh, are, are typically the worst. And by day three is when you start to feel a little bit more like yourself. So you just got to make it through those first two days. You can take the pain medications. We can always increase them. Um, you know, at least in my practice, you'll get a phone call from me or somebody else close on my team who will follow up to make sure. Um, I oftentimes, the therapist will call us and say, hey, this patient's not doing well. I'm worried about this. Um, so if there's an issue, we'll get a, we'll get a phone call. Um, multimodal pain. So you'll, you'll take Tylenol, you'll take anti-inflammatories, uh, narcotics. We try to come off those quickly within a week because they're just not good for you long-term. And then there's blocks that we use now. So we numb up some of the nerves around the knee or the hip that work really well. So there's good ways to deal with it and we'll get you through it, I guess is the best way to put it. So <clears throat> you will be on a blood thinner. That blood thinner is dependent on if you've had a history of clots, um, you, you know, let's say if you've had a blood clot previously, we'll put you on a, a stronger blood thinner. If not, we typically use aspirin now, and that actually works pretty well. So post-op day, you know, two to four, starting to feel a little more like yourself, getting to the two-week mark. Um, we want you using walker uh, or crutches. We want you up walking around the house. Uh, maybe go to the mailbox. Um, this, is, this is the most important thing is what about my bowel movement? This is the worst part uh, from the two to 14 day mark, the narcotics, the anesthesia, that can be worse than the actual pain from the surgery. So um, we've gotten a whole lot better at starting the Senecot, starting the Metamucil, starting that stuff early and making sure we stay on top of it. Because uh, you know the last thing you want is to be admitted with a bowel obstruction um, and that stuff happens with these medications. So, um, you know, a lot of people don't like to talk about it or very open about it because it's a big deal. Um, and that can be, that can be worse than the pain from the surgery itself. So I do tell my patients that they're worried about it. You know, I haven't had a bowel movement in three or four days, as long as you're passing gas, that means the pipe, the pipes aren't plugged and that we can just continue with the center and things like that. And be, be careful with, uh, enemas that can that can cause more problems than help, um, but that's something that we're that, that you need to really keep an eye on. 
Um, blood thinners, again, you know, you're on a blood thinner, which is good for blood clots, but it can cause bleeding. And so we worry about, you know, excessive bleeding through the bandage that doesn't stop. Um, you know, if you have a blood clot, chest, chest pain, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, those are all things that you need to call the on-call doctor or somebody to talk about, because those are things that we don't want to go, we don't want to miss. Um, and then severe calf pain. Again, you're going to have calf pain because you've just had a big surgery on your knee. If it's a knee replacement, hip's a little different. We just, we just want to know. And oftentimes we'll get a blood clot scan. It's an ultrasound, a non-invasive test, um, just to rule it out and make sure, because those are things we just don't want to miss. So, um, you know, I tell my patients, I give my office number for a reason, and I'm happy to answer questions. If you're worried about something, please call us. So that's really important, I think. Again, the post-op red flags, uh, severe pain out of proportion, painful mechanical clicking, popping, snapping. Your new joint will make noise. But if it's super painful, that's something we want to look at. That's a little, that's a little weird. Um, and then the patient who's doing well and then has a giant backslide and, and doesn't get better after that. You're going to have good days and bad days. But if two weeks later, you know, you're still on crutches and you had been walking around, um, you know, I, I had a patient who she was three months from surgery with a total hip, best thing she ever did. And she kind of reached over and bent over and fell off the couch and fell a big rip in her hip and, um, you know, presented three days later with continued severe pain. That, that stuff is, is, is concerning to us. Um, so post-op six weeks, um, this is when I see the patient back in the office. They see, they see us, they see me at six weeks and I say, you finally run the gauntlet. So the first six weeks are the most, the, the, the most critical. There were the highest risk of complications, blood clots, infections, dislocations, fractures, um, anything that can happen bad typically happens in the first six weeks. And that's not a guarantee. But once you've made it to the six week mark, it, it, that's like you can take a deep breath. Um, you can start to, to increase your outdoor walking. You're starting to feel better because your blood loss, you're, you're building your blood levels back up. Um, a lot of patients will go back to work at six weeks. Some will go back to work three or four days because a lot of it depends on your job, obviously. Um, if you're, uh, you know, do a lot of computer work, you can do that sooner. Um, if you work at Boeing and are in and out of the planes all day long, well, that's more probably like eight to 10 weeks. But Typically, a lot of people will go back to work at six weeks. Um, you can drive at six weeks. I didn't put that on here, but that's a big one. Um, driving, uh, typically, I tell patients six weeks, although a lot of people do it before. You, you just have to be careful with that because your reaction time does take about six weeks to return, especially if it's the right lower extremity. Um, I get people off the blood thinners, and I tell them you are 20% healed. You have 80% to go. But that first 20% is the hardest, and, and, and that's you, you've made it through kind of the, the roughest part. So uh, two to six months, um, you get this rapid improvement. And then the two to six month mark, it's the slow, steady, um, you're better week to week type of a thing. I get people back to their previous activity levels. I tell them this is a marathon. It's going to take a long time. You get what you get in a year. You start doing golf, tennis, riding your bike, swimming all the stuff you want to do, but you're not doing it at the level you want to do it at. I tell people, if you do something, I want you to feel like you can do it again. So if you go on a hike, I want that hike, I want you to be able to do that hike again. I don't want you to get so far out in the woods that you have a hard time getting back. That's pushing it too much. Um, this tip of the, you know, uh, again, you're still improving, but now you're kind of glad you had it and you're getting back to the things you want to do. Golfers, I send my golfers out to the range. I tell them don't walk 18, um, things like that. <clears throat> So one year is kind of the finish line. Um, some studies recently have shown knee improvement up to 18 months. I, I, again, I, I like to use the one year mark, but you can use 18 months if you want. Um, I don't give my patients any restrictions. Most don't return to running. I tell them you can try, but the studies show that only about 30% of patients return to long distance running. You can run, you know, tennis is running. I'm talking about pounding the pavement for a 13 mile or a 22 mile run. It just usually doesn't happen because you get some thigh pain. Um, but there are some people out there that can do it. Uh, but otherwise I tell people hike, bike, ski, swim, you can do what you want to do. That's why we actually did your surgery. So um, this is surgeon specific. Um, there's nothing that I do that's different than somebody else. As far as a different implant, you may be told by one surgeon, don't do that stuff. I, I, I find that 
I'm, you know, patients do what they want to do. And that's kind of why we do the surgery. So uh, my hope is, is by this point, you have forgotten about me uh, and you are out doing the things that you want to do and, and, and forgot you had your joint replaced. So um, kind of some at a glance stuff. Uh, um, you know, there, there, there isn't a lot of hip precautions with an anterior approach. If you have a posterior approach, I do both. Um, uh, if you have a posterior approach, you will have hip precautions. So no bending over 90, uh, abductor pillow, things like that. Um, with the bike, you want to avoid, people love bikes, but you will want to avoid bending over the handlebars and your therapist will talk to you about this. That really causes a lot of impingement in the front of the hip. Um, so you want to ride the bike like this guy is, you want to ride it like a beach cruiser sitting straight up in the air and that'll be, that'll be helpful. Get the seat up higher. Uh, things like that will be helpful. Um, and then with knees, everybody else concentrate on how much can I bend it? I care how much can you straighten it? Because people like to sit with the knee bent like 10 degrees. That's more comfortable. They don't like full extension. This 10 degrees will make all the difference in the world. And what I mean is, is that single, single leg stairs, you need that last 10 degrees to be able to do single leg stairs. So don't forget about extension. Flexion is very important but extension is as, if not more important in the first six weeks, in my opinion. Um, so uh, again, some general ideas, full extension, very important. Um, people like to, again, tell me what their flexion number is. I ask them, what's your extension number? That's more important, uh, especially in the first six weeks. Um, uh, hips, just kind of give it time. Uh, you want to take it easy with the hips. They, they will get better on their own a lot, a lot more than the knees where the knees, you got to be a lot more involved typically. Um, uh, and then kind of the three month mark, kind of like we talked about, that's the return to court, return to the field, return to the range, things like that. Although a lot of people with the way we're doing things now actually return a lot quicker. So, uh, so what do we do after a year? Well, how do I keep my joint? How do I not wear it out? How do I not have to come back and see you for 20 or 25 years? Uh, the answer is keep moving and keep your weight down. Joints are made to move and these things that we put in are supposed to, you know, you're, you're, you're supposed to use them. Um, the old studies show 80% of joints last 20 years. Those were joints that were put in 20 years ago. What we're putting in now my hope is it lasts for 25 years or, 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 or longer. Um, in any event, if you have to have a revision, um, patients do very well from revisions and we don't see that being a huge, huge issue. Um, every doctor is very different. Uh, I typically tell my patients x-rays every five to 10 years. Um, most of the time patients will come back when they're having symptoms. If they're doing well, they typically don't come back. And then signs of wear, pain, mechanical symptoms, clicking, catching, locking, all of a sudden somebody had a total hip and then it starts to dislocate, you know, 15 or 20 years later. Well, that's a sign that it's possibly wearing out. So obviously we'd want to see you back for that. Um, and then you'll, you'll kind of hear some different, uh, so dental prophylaxis, people can get late joint infections and that's a devastating, but very rare, thank God, complication. I do give my patients an antibiotic to take before they get their teeth cleaned. It's twice a year. It's only one dose. And I think that the studies that say you don't need it are poor. And I haven't been convinced yet. Now I have some people who have allergies to the, the medications. They can't take them for whatever reason. That, that's okay. I have some people who choose not to, but my recommendation and all my partners, honestly. So I think there's at least five or six of us that do joints in my practice. Uh, we've all talked about it and we all recommend it at least at this point. Although there are some people who don't, and, and, and it's kind of a uh, up in the air topic, uh, depending on who you talk to. But that's a discussion to have with your physician specifically. Um, and again, at least if, if I get my patients to take an uh, informed decision about it, then, then we can go either way with that. But I typically do recommend an antibiotic. So, so how do you find your surgeon? Um, look for somebody who's fellowship trained. Uh, we all do five years of residency, and then we all should now, 90% of us do one year specializing uh, in our specific field. So I don't do hand surgery anymore. I don't do carpal tunnels. I don't do shoulders. Uh, um, you know, we, we all, especially in the Seattle kind of west side uh, area, um, all kind of specialize in our specific field. Um, and, and it's just kind of the way of medicine is going now. When I first started, only 50% of surgeons did a fellowship. Now it's well over 90. 
I think the number is really over 50 a year. Uh, the studies in any surgery you look at, cardiac, any surgery over 50 a year, that means they're doing it often and frequent enough that things become kind of routine and it's not a new procedure. And typically that's when you see the complications numbers decrease. So I, I think that's a good number to look at, although the vast majority of joint surgeons in the area do way more than that. So I think that's a good number to look for though. Um, personal recommendations, you know, friends or, or family who've seen people are good. Um, other professionals, especially some of the nursing staff, physical therapy, they, they see. I mean, a physical therapist spends hours with my patients, more, much more than I do. And so I think they're good recommendations. And then multiple opinions are always a good thing. Um, I tell people, if you see a doctor who tells you not, tells you not to get a second opinion, see another doctor. That, that we, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be offended by that. And if we are, that's a red flag in my opinion. So finally, um, you know, what are you putting in my body? And this is a very good question. I get it all the time. Hips and knees are now titanium. Uh, uh, or mainly hips are titanium. So you can see the cup in the upper right-hand corner there. The cup that I use is now actually 3D printed. So we used to take a big block of titanium and cut it and make the cup. And now we actually print these on 3D printers through additive manufacturing, which is pretty cool. Um, I typically use a ceramic head. So that pink head you see in the bottom right there for my hips. And then I use a plastic liner. So that X3 polyethylene um, is very highly cross-linked and has great wear properties for my hips. Knees are cobalt chrome or kind of a, a, a knee. And then there's a plastic liner in the middle of that as well. Um, there has not been a documented, at least that I know of, people don't reject total hips. Titanium is very well um, uh, uh, tolerated. There, you know, that there's not a metal allergy to the hips. Uh, the knees, there are some that, that think that you can have a metal allergy to the knee. It's extremely rare. I've probably seen it three or four times in my entire career. So it's not something that's very common. Um, but that's, those are the implants that we use now. They're kind of um, uh, 3D printed, uh, titanium. They're going to last for, for a very long time. Uh, so I use an anterior approach for my hips, probably 80% of the time, 20% of the time I do posterior. That's a total different discussion for why I do that. And I would have that with a patient when they asked me. Um, I do a lot of robotic surgery now. I think that's really a, a kind of the wave of the future. Again, you're going to get different opinions on that. I didn't train with a robot, um, so I can do it the old school way if I need to, but I just find it's quicker. Um, I find that I feel like it's a quicker recovery for the patient, and um, I think it's a good tool to use in the OR. <clears throat> um, everything, you know, the, one of the real important things is that everybody rehabs in a different fashion. Don't compare yourself to your neighbor. The end goal is the same, and that's that you forget about me in one year. So just, just you know, I, it's six weeks. I'm always telling my patients, you know, give yourself some credit. You're doing great. You made it through the, you know, the hard part of this and things look good. Um, again, it's a marathon. If you think of it like that, uh, then you're typically going to do well. Um, so again, robotics is kind of part of my, my, my practice. Uh, I don't press the button and go have coffee. Uh, the, uh, every once in a while, I get the question of, well, what does it do? Um, this is kind of the idea. So I'm still doing all the work. It just, it's like Google maps. You type in the address, but you drive the car. So I'm driving the car, but this is helping me get there quicker. Uh, so I think it's actually a pretty, pretty good, uh, pretty good tool to use moving forward. I do it for hips and knees. Uh, I think it decreases blood loss. I think, uh, overall there's improvement, although some of the studies would say no. And, and you, a lot of patients, a lot of people get good at good outcomes without it. So it's not necessarily hundred percent tied to that. Um, and then you're able to dial things in uh, pretty, pretty quickly is what I like about it. Again, I do the vast majority of my surgeries, 85% anterior for hips. Um, but if there's severe deformity, body habitus issues, I do posterior because at one year, there is no difference between my anterior or my posterior patient. So they are not getting a bad surgery with posterior. It's not an inferior surgery. It's just different, uh, which is really important, I think. Here's kind of a picture of where the incisions go. The anterior is kind of off the ASIS, the front of the hip. The posterior is off the hip pointer, so the outside of your hip when you push when you push there. Um, uh, 
again, incision placement is, is kind of a big, is, is the major, major difference. Um, with an anterior, you're more on your back and you can use x-ray and things like that. Uh, the anterior does, has been shown to recover quicker, but at one year, it is no different than a posterior. And so what's important is how it goes in, not which way, uh, in my opinion. This is what the anterior approach looks like. Uh, there's a HANA table. Uh, this is kind of my surgical tool that I use. It's like my, my assistant. Um, you're, you're asleep on the table, and this is kind of what helps us do the surgery. So I can stop here if we want, or I can keep going. Oops, sorry. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, we can cut this part. It's obviously getting a little bit long. So, um, but if people are interested. So, uh, you, you know, uh, I get a lot of patients who ask me, you know, why should I do the anterior approach? For me, the interoperative placement is easier. Uh, the socket exposure is easier and the dislocation rate is lower. I think there's a steep learning curve. And so if somebody only does this five or 10 times a year, you're at risk of having complications, and I, I would not, I would not do it uh, uh, that way for sure. Um, they can rehab quicker, which is good news. Um, there's no restrictive hip precautions, which people really like. Wearing the, the the pillow between your legs, no bending past 90, is really a difficult thing to deal with, uh, especially for three months. Um, I think the drawbacks, because there's a drawback to everything, is the incisions in the front. Uh, you can get some thigh numbness. Um, and then there's some, you know, hip flexion weakness. So picking the leg up in the air, that can be the last thing that comes back and that can take some time. And so that's one of the, one of the kind of drawbacks that we have with an anterior approach. <clears throat> For the knees, I typically, the best way I know how to describe it is I like to put it in like it was when you were 20. So if you go to the airport or the mall and watch people walk, everybody has a different gait. People have knock knees, they have, you know, a wider kind of, uh, uh, everybody just walks and has much different setup. My goal is, is to restore your setup, uh, how it was when you were, when you were younger. Um, and I find it's called kinematics. It's, we put the knee in like it was, like it was meant to be, or like you were born with. Um, and, and I find that this actually works out uh, pretty well and people do very well with this. So my, my, I would say my outcomes have improved uh, as I've changed um, to a more kind of natural or more anatomic position for my knees. Here's what a knee looks like. Um, again, two metal components and in the middle you have the plastic component. Um, and this is what kind of, it's more like a resurfacing. So people think you would actually cut big chunks of bone out, you don't. It's actually thin wafers, kind of smaller cuts that you make. Uh, people do very well with this as well too. So, 